So let's start to go here. So we're going to talk, about, and so this is going to um, kind of a nuts and bolts talk. Some of you are probably very familiar with heat pumps, so the first part will be a little bit um, redundant about heat pumps, but then we'll get into sort of try to get into specific situations, what to think about with your home. Um, and then the last part will talk about how do you get good systems, installation, and how to work with contractors. So a lot of people really don't know what a heat pump is. And basically what you can think of, first of all, a heat pump is just a reversible air conditioner. Air conditioners uh, move heat out of the house and into the outside in the summer. Heat pump can take heat from the outside and move it in the winter. And the thing is we're moving heat, not temperature. So people get confused. They say, well, when it's zero out, how, do I, how am I heating my house with zero? Well, the air actually still contains a lot of heat. In fact, only when it gets to minus 450, 60 degrees Fahrenheit is, are, is there no heat. So you can think of it as a concentrator. So this isn't just a real schematic, broad schematic. If it's 60 degrees outdoors, I'm pulling in a lot of the air from across my heat pump unit here in the middle, and it's extracting the heat and it's making this cube of indoor air 68. If it's 30 degrees outdoors, the heat pump has to take a lot more air in and extract the heat out because there's less heat per, per cubic unit of air. So it's just moving heat. And this is a pretty simplified schematic of how it works. Um, like I mentioned, if someone wants more details, you can always email me. Um, but let's start down here. So this is the outside unit, the box. This will be the inside unit. So this would be an air handler or a coil, like an air conditioning coil at the top of your furnace. So what we have is it comes out of the house, we have cool cool liquid in the line. And actually it's, it's very cool, it's below zero. Cycles through the coils, air's blowing through it and it picks up the heat. Now refrigerant has special properties that it actually really likes to uh, absorb heat and change phase. So what it does, even though it's cold, it's absorbing the heat and changing into a warm gas. And then it comes, this is all within the unit but it's not really warm enough to heat your house yet. So depending on the temperature and the time of the year, it comes into a compressor. This is where we add some energy. You compress that warm gas and you warm it up and it needs to be about 110 degrees. So then it's a warm gas, goes through, it goes into the coils and the coils and, and the air blows by these warm coils and it heats the air and it goes into your house. Now with a there's also an air to water system where it comes in and it goes and there's a water coils wrapped and it transfers the heat to the, to the water. Then what happens is it cools off, loses energy, comes out. But here's another key thing. Here's an expansion valve. So it's pretty constrained in the pipe. It's allowed to expand, which by expansion, it cools off, becomes a liquid again, and the cycle reverses. And basically, um, and then in the summertime, this system just is called a reversing valve inside and, it's, and it reverses. And basically these units, you would look at them from the outside, you would not know any difference in terms of that heat pump or an air conditioner. Surprisingly, it's just got a reversing valve. So this technology is not new. It's been around for a long time, since the 1950s. And, um, but they're, they're, it's called, let's call it classic heat pumps. And heat pumps really weren't designed to work below freezing. And so in New Mexico, in zones three and four, these are climate zones. I'm sure there's lots of heat pumps down in these areas here. In fact, if you looked at the manufacturer's website back then, they would show lines where the heat pumps would work. What we're talking about now is, is an evolution, cold climate heat pumps, which will work very well in zone five. And in fact, in all climate zones in the US. And that started about 2005. It started in a certain part of the country. The research um, gas prices went up in New England, in Europe and Japan, the higher energy costs. People were like, there's no fundamental reasons why heat pumps um, can't work in colder climates. So they started to work on them. And there's thousands of installations throughout the US and Canada and around the world. So it's, it's an it's established technology. Now, before we talk a little bit more about the innards of the heat pumps and a little bit more detail, I wanna talk about something that 
kind of most people aren't familiar with. You, you tend to think in your in your climate zone, you spend a lot of our energy when it's really cold. That's just not true. So this is what this is, is this is the percent of annual heating use um, at different outdoor temperatures. So on the left, zero on the bottom, I have zero degrees outdoor up to 60 degrees. And on the, on the vertical axis is 0% to 20%. And you can see that the bulk in uh, Los Alamos slash Santa Fe, that the bulk of the heating is basically energy is between 22 and about 42 degrees, the majority of it. The, perp the orange line, which goes down the middle, represents sort of where the classic heat pumps would go. And that's about 67% of the energy use. But you couldn't put just one of those alone. You'd have to have something else working with it. Now, with cold climate heat pumps, they actually work all the way down to zero and some work less than zero. So now you can basically, in, in all these other climate zones, basically heat your entire house with the heat pump technology. There's one more line on this chart, and that's the heat pump efficiency line. And it starts out at, at four. And that COP, and I'll describe it in a couple of slides, basically is um, coefficient of performance. And it says, four says for every one unit of electricity, the heat pump can move four energy units of heat. Now, as it gets colder, it's harder for the heat pump to extract heat. So in the main area, it's about three. And down here, where it's really cold, it's two, which is still very good compared to other technologies. For example, electric heating is just a COP of one. So keep this in mind here when we talk about um, the next few slides. So how did they, how did they make cold, heat, cold climate heat pumps? What did they do? Well, Fortunately, with heat pumps, there's a lot of things to uh, tweak in terms of the engineer, the engineering and how to improve many components. The biggest thing is that compressor I talked about where it compresses the refrigerant. <clears throat> they basically did a lot of advancements in compressors used to be sort of on off. Now they have multi-stage and variable speed compressors. Well, that helps the heat pump doesn't have to deliver any more heat than needed. The blowers inside, inside units, either the blowers at the top of the furnace, if you're using with a furnace, or the blowers in an air handler are a lot better. Fan blades, controls, um, these coil, the heat exchange design. And a big thing is frost retarding and defrosting strategies. So if you think about it, when it gets in around freezing, just above freezing and, and in the 20s a lot of times, this thing could naturally tend to frost up. So you got to have strategies for defrosting. So all this work uh, resulted in, in two big improvements. One is the ability to heat or the capacity. And again, this is outdoor temperature from zero outdoors up to 60. And the green line is a hypothetical house, pretty typical house. And this is how much heat it takes to heat that house at the various outdoor temperatures, 5,000 BTUs up to 60,000. And, and these lines here are how much heating capacity a heat pump can put out. They all start out very high. It's very easy for them to put out a lot of heat when it's mild out. But in around the early part of the, the classic ones, when it gets cold below 30, they really weren't designed to work in that temperature, if, and if they had defrost, they couldn't put out a lot of heat. But over time, every two years or so, the next generation would improve, improve, improve. And now notice that at between about 15 degrees, I have a heat pump that has the capacity almost as much as it does at 40 or 50, and it tails off. And in fact, some of the newer generation heat pumps, this line stays close to flat all the way out to zero. So this area right in here, this part between 15 and 30, now the heat pumps have the capability, the capacity to do it. The second big improvement was efficiency. And the bottom of this is uh, 2012 to 2020. And HSPF, I'll, I'll define these terms a little bit more next slide, but what HSPF means is 
heating season performance factor that says through a heating season, how efficient are these units? And they start out about 8.2 and they keep improving every couple of years. The best ones are 13. Right now, most, manuf most of the units, if you went out and are looking and want to get quotes, most of the units are in the 10 to 11 range, which is basically 20 to 35% more efficient than the 8.2. So a big leap in efficiency. This has made the units more cost effective. Also notice electric baseboard is a HSPF of around 3.4. So much greater, basically you know, over three to four times more efficient. So here's all these terms I've been throwing out. I slide here. So tons is not this dude. It's um, heating and cooling tons. So it's amount of energy. 12,000 BTU per hour is a ton. And to just give you an idea for those of you who don't know, most homes are three to six tons. People who have air conditioners, you might've heard the contractor say, oh, this is a three ton unit, a four ton unit, et cetera. The other thing is SEER, which is a seasonal efficiency energy rate. And this is really has to do with cooling. And the equipment range is from 15 to 24. And 24 uses half the energy of 12. The higher the number, the better. So even if you never buy a heat pump and you go out and buy air conditioner again, I would really behoove you to get a very good energy efficient air conditioner with a higher SEER. You pay a little bit more, but over the 15 year lifespan, it makes a difference. This is the number HFPF, higher the number, the better. And this, these two are somewhat related. This is over a heating season. This is a coefficient of performance under our conditions. So furnaces are 0.8 to 0.95. Electric strip heat is one. The heat pumps we're talking about are around three. Remember on that chart I showed you, they go from four to two, but an average about three. Now, for those of you who are familiar with or I'm sure ground source heat pumps are 4.5. That's where you put pipes in the ground and you use the consistent heat of the earth to heat them. We're not going to really talk about them today, but anyone who's interested, please feel free to email me and I can, uh, I can uh, have an exchange with you. Um, two key COP uses half the energy of one. So a big difference. <clears throat> so what we're going to do now is talk about, you know, more down to earth. Okay. How can I use heat pumps in my houses? What's my situation? So we'll talk about whole house ducted systems, heat pumps, either replacing it with the furnaces completely with an air handle or what's a hybrid, I'm gonna call a hybrid system. So remember that term, that's a heat pump paired with a furnace. Um, really cool technology, multi-zone mini split heat pumps, no duct, some they're called ductless mini duct systems. So they have different heads inside. They have ceiling mounts, hidden ones, which is new, wall mounts, et cetera. I'll talk about how you can use those systems for, for additions and, uh, and uh, baseboard electric replacement. And finally, there's air to water heat pumps. So this is a technology where the air, rather than blowing by the coil, it comes and it transfers it in a cylinder, makes warm water. These are fine for underfloor heating, not so much for radiators. Um, I'll have a slide on it. There are technologies out there, but it's somewhat limited use right now. So we talked a little bit about this, but let's let's talk about, all right, now you're, you're, you don't have natural gas, basically. <clears throat> you're heating with propane or electric. And uh, so here's these HSPFs I talked about. The bottom line is the heat pump uses 68% less electricity. And you're going to save anywhere from 50 to 70% um, on your heating if you just replace your electric with heat pump. And for propane, it uses about a third of the energy of propane, and you'll save 50 to 60%. And it depends on the relative cost. Now, this is, comes from, like, there's some talks with new home construction. All this applies to new home when you're considering what kind of units to do. In the past, when people didn't have access to natural gas, they would all, most of the time go with propane because it was less than electric. But now with heat pumps, basically the heat pump strategy is lower. So things have kind of turned on their head in terms of thinking philosophy 
for those of you who are considering a new home, whereas especially in your climate area, heat pumps work perfect, is uh, basically to uh, think about a heat pump strategy first. Oh, natural gas, I'm gonna get to that. That's about four slides now. Um, but this is the, the first one, the easiest one for comparison. So what, you, what, what your contractor will do is they'll build a model in the computer of your house. And this is uh, called Right Suite. And this is comparing eating a, a typical house here. And what it is is a base system is a propane furnace. This is the climate of, uh, <clears throat> in your area. I put the climate zone in. And this is the amount of cooling and the cost of cooling and the cost of heating. This will be with an air conditioner, heat pump sort of in the same level. But notice the heating cost and the big savings. This is versus an electric furnace, which baseboard would be the same. And this is with a heat pump. So huge amounts of savings for this house. And you know what you can do is if you know your heating bill, um, your propane heating bill, or you could figure out your electric, you can sort of take those, these ratios I told you above, you know, about 60% or so, 50, 60%, and calculate it out, just cut your bill by that much, and you'll know in your home roughly what the heat pump's going to save you. Now, this is at $1.15 or uh, 11.5 cents. This is Los Alamos um, utility electric, average electric rate at 209 for propane. <clears throat> so now you've got your old system and, and you're, you're thinking about, well, all right, my furnace just went out. What am I going to do? Normally you call a person and say, give me a new furnace. Well, <clears throat> this is a comparison with electric. And this is propane. And what's going on here is the savings is about this much, 2405 for this house, the ballpark system costs. Now, a lot of people, you're gonna have different numbers. Uh, you know, this business, the price to do things are all over. I'm trying to just give ballpark cost. Replace a furnace, put in a heat pump system, which would be not with a furnace. This is not a hybrid. This is just plain old heat pump. Um, this is electric with AC and that. And you can see that um, 7,500 more, but it's gonna pay back in a few years here one year. Now note here, I've put over here, for any of you, this isn't true for the Los Alamos utility, but any of you that are in a, a co-op electric supplier, there's very good rebates from the ones that are in Tri-State, most of New Mexico ones. So basically you would get around 1,500 to $2,000 off of here. Now looking at propane, uh, Notice the similar thing. We've got not quite as much savings, similar pricing strategies, a little bit longer. But if with the rebates, basically, this cuts this time down about a year. So the whole point of this is, you know, rather than just say, hey, I'm going to just replace my furnace or air conditioner. As you know, you look at the heat pump system. And it's for a little bit more, you're going to save quite a bit of money. So let's talk about natural gas. Someone asked about that in the, in the uh, chat. So we got the scenarios. Um, my air conditioner furnace, I have them both. They're both old. I'm going to get replaced with both. And you can replace with a heat pump and a furnace, or you can just go, which is a hybrid system, or you could just do a heat pump and an air hand. So let's say the AC is old and failing, but your furnace is in good shape. So this is something... Um, you really don't want to mix and match. So you want to get the same brand. And what you want to try to do is talk to the contractors and say, I have a furnace is at this level. I'm going to get a heat pump. And this is even true with air conditioning. I, it needs to be sort of the same generation of technology. <clears throat> and mainly it has to do with the fan inside the furnace or that fan and the coil and, the, and how well they talk to each other. If you don't have a match system, you could lose about 25% efficiency. So that's something to keep in mind. And at some point you might be on the fence and, and, the, and the contractor might say, you know, it makes more sense to replace them both. Um, no AC, you just, you know, replace with a heat pump and a furnace together, which, you know, it's an extra piece of equipment or you can just do a heat pump. Now, 
And the next slide I'm going to show about costing. Generally against, well, against gas prices, uh, heat pumps still, even though they're a lot more efficient, will cost more to operate. Uh, but what you can do in the, that most of these cases is you can do a heat pump with existing furnace matching or a heat pump with a new furnace, a pair. So what does it gain? It's insurance against future gas prices. So for one-time additional cost, you now have two different systems that can heat your, heat your house and you can decide how much of each one you wanna use depending on the cost of fuel. And I'll show you that in the next two slides. The other one, a lot of people now, you know, they wanna try to decrease their air pollution or their carbon footprint. And so what you can do is heat pumps, even though it might cost a little more to operate, you can run your heat pump a bit, cut down how much your emissions are, how much natural gas you use, and spend a little bit extra per month if that's something you want to do. So you've got these two benefits. And the main thing is really, you know, doing an AC in a furnace, a heat pump in a furnace, it's almost really uh, takes little thought because you have these big advantages. Um, it is going to cost a little bit more. Um, the one thing you got to be careful is make sure the contractor provides you with apples to apples quotes. I mean, you don't want him to have to quote you a low end air conditioner and furnace versus a furnace with a low end air conditioner, furnace, high end heat pump. Um, they got to be apples to apples. So let's, let's look at how this would play out if you wanted to have these choices. Um, electric's the same. Now this is interesting. This is the natural gas uh, price in March, 55 a therm. And um, you know, it's floats around there the last couple of years, down a little bit, up a little bit. And this is a gas furnace. I didn't bother with cooling this time. It's just a little distracting. You'll be able to say heating, seven, $711, very inexpensive. Um, now this is if I run the heat pump to 45. So remember, when it's mild out, the heat pump's more efficient, higher COP. So 25% of my heating is with a heat pump now. I'm paying a little bit more per month, but you can figure it out, and I'll show you in a couple slides. I'm using less gas, and that might be something that's important to you. Uh, or it can be set up, and usually a contractor sets the change over temperature. Some of them you can set in the thermostat. Here, I'm gonna run the heat pump a little more down to 25, which is 84% of the heating in your, in your area. Uh, if you remember that chart I showed you, <clears throat> um, it's gonna cost more. And here's a, here's a full heat pump. It's not a hybrid system. This is an all heat pump with a little bit of a, maybe a little electric inside of it. And so it's more. So this is, you know, this is pretty um, typical of what you would see. However, remember there was two reasons I was encouraging you to consider the heat pump hybrid option. One is um, you can do this, you can save gas if you want. The other is as a, uh, as a uh, insurance. Well, we actually just had an insurance example. Uh, so if you go to the April natural gas prices, Los Alamos, they jumped to $1.22 a therm. Part of it was the Texas fiasco and other stuff. These big jumps are usually not normal. The last one was like Katrina. So you get them. Um, but what this example is gonna show is over the 15 years of having your system, there's good chances you're gonna, we're gonna go through waves where gas is more expensive, where gas goes back to normal. Like right now we've been in a very low wave. So here's what happened. Just the only change I made was the gas price three times, which is, you know, and so I, this number stayed the same. This number went up a little bit because I'm using a little gas. This number went, so all of a sudden the whole game's flipped. All gas heating is more, all heat pump is less. Now you're not gonna wanna go out, and change your system every month or so. But the point would be, is we go into years where the trend is up and it's more expensive. You have the ability to, you know, you could go a middle ground, like I could take, I could have been doing mostly heat pump, thousand dollars, a thousand dollars. You know, so you've got these two capabilities, especially versus just 
plain old air conditioning, which doesn't get you anything. <clears throat> For those of you who have different indoor situations where you might have, there's two scenarios, electric baseboard, you might have high temperature radiant baseboard, either propane or natural gas. The economics are gonna basically be the same. In other words, it's gonna save a lot versus electric baseboard. It's gonna save a lot versus propane. Gas, it might be a little bit more. It's gonna be more uh, than if when gas is low, but as gas goes up, it might be. But the beauty of this technology is you don't have to, you know, you can run these small refrigerant lines. You got these nice units, ceiling, wall, floor. And one of the better ones, I think it's come out last 10 years more prevalent is, is these little slim ducts. So this is beautiful if you want to do a second floor because you can have this unit up in here and do a small duct off of one of these. You can do two bedrooms. So um, there's a lot of flexibility that fit in with your specific house. So this would be, I have all electric baseboards. I really want to stop using them. All right, I can do a lot of stuff with this. So we, you have one outdoor unit. It can usually, you can heat as many as four of these zones, four of these units, which technically you could do eight rooms if they're big rooms. Uh, and in climate, in your climate zone, uh, in climate zone, actually, that's a mistake. It should be five. Um, it can heat, you know, up to 2,000 square foot, one of these units. So the number of indoor units is generally number of rooms you want to heat minus one. Normally, you're going to do an open area, kitchen, living room together. And if you're replacing baseboards, you want to focus on the main rooms. You don't want to put these heads in little rooms. It's not cost effective. So these, the bathrooms, closet, mudrooms, you could just leave on your baseboard, whatever. And here's how people are using them. Um, often they'll say, well, the second story, and sometimes this is going on even if they don't want to replace their existing heating system. They want cooling on the second floor. So you could put these systems on the second floor in the attic. You get cooling and you can sometimes get some, you know, unless it's gas, you're going to get cost savings. Or if you want to get the most cost saving, you do the main floor. Um, large single story homes, people do different wings. If you have a hot wing, a cold, or a wing that's cold, let's say your heating system isn't very good. Um, the north side is always cold. Well, you can put this in, save some energy, save some money. And obviously extensions are great. Um, you don't have to extend your current system. You don't have to upsize it, which often expensive. You can just Put this and now your addition actually has its own dedicated system, a lot better, more comfortable. So I did mention with propane boilers, and this is really for in slab heating because in slab and warm board, the floors requires low temperature. Heat water, say 115 in the slab. These hybrid systems with the heat pumps they can do about 115 and they can save some money versus propane. This is really, if you're on natural gas, this is probably not a strategy you want to try to employ. Um, and they're very good for smaller homes. In the appendix, when you get that, there's a list of about five manufacturers that make these systems. The difficulty is it's, uh, it's a niche. So there's not, you, you can't really pick up the phone much and call people say, oh, I want to do this. So my advice is for those of you who are engineers or really understand this, want to do that, you have a great radiant system or a great plumber, you know, it would be your project. Uh, but feel free if you're curious or interested, look at that. You can email me. I can give you some more advice on that. Um, and if you want to do it with an old boiler and stuff, don't wait for it to blow out. Plan ahead. Now, I will tell you, this technology is pretty advanced. In Europe and Japan, they have very integrated systems, but uh, they're not in the US because we don't have a big enough market. So the other thing I talked about, and some of you, this will be very important, is like CO2 emissions. Uh, this is kind of a sample from, uh, you know, this is a sort of typical of, say, a, a Rocky Mountain utility and their current energy mix. And this is how many pounds of CO2 per year. 
All electric heating is a lot still because it's just not very efficient. And propane and gas are here. A heat pump with electric is lower. It's about tie right now the, with our mix of gas and coal and renewables. And then a heat pump with propane and gas is less. But look at what happens. This is, you know, 2030, they're trying to, one of the utilities, a lot of them um, in Colorado, and I think some in New Mexico are working towards, you know, this is the kind of reduction. You're not going to get much change in your gas and your propane a little bit because you use a little electricity. But um, with, the, with the heat pumps over the 15 years, so think now you buy it 2022 to 2037, you're going to basically, uh, if this is important, cutting down your CO2 and to give it, put it in perspective, if you go out and trade your car in, get an electric car, this is about what you'll save. So electric cars are pretty expensive relative to a little bit more for these systems. Um, one thing that's important is indoor air quality. And I we had horrible fires in Colorado last year. I don't know if you had them in the Southern Rockies. Six weeks, we had to keep our houses tight, shut in, we couldn't open the windows. This, these are units that bring in fresh air. The difference is that they have a little exchanger in here and it exchanges the heat and you can even get some filtering. So you bring in air that's hot, but it, your house is cool and it helps exchange it. And in the, in the winter, same thing, you know, you have heated hot home air, you pull in some cold air, it warms it up and you get some fresh air. So this is a really nice system. And for those of you who are building new homes, you want to uh, consider having these in here. Um, and, and also, I just want you to know, there's heat pump water heaters now. Uh, electric heat pump water heater uses less energy. It's not doesn't save a lot on gas versus gas, but versus an electric water heater, saves a lot of money. I got a few more slides. I want to talk about if you want to really think about doing this and you're going to go out call up a couple people. The first thing you need to do is talk to them. They need a great system design, which means manual J. It says, all right, what's my house need? It used to be the first person that built the house said, oh, the heating needs to be five ton. Here's a five ton furnace. Every, every other person that comes after that when the furnace needs replaced, here's a five ton furnace. Here's a five ton furnace. It didn't matter. Gas didn't cost much. And and we weren't so worried about efficiency. So here's what happens. You put in uh, New Mexico, and what they're going to do is model it, and, and you're going to have outdoor temperature, and it says, how hot, how much heating do I need? How off, what's the off hours, the system, how much heat can it output? This is a heat pump. How much am I going to have to have a little bit of backup, be it, a, if it, if this is with a little tiny electric strip in it, hardly any, or am I going to have a little gas? So they'll do this model. And they'll come up with a nice size match. This is what I showed before. Outdoor temperature, 0 to 60. How much heating you need. That's the green line. Oh, and so they, they do the model and they, they get a match. They're not going to show you this graph, but to illustrate, well, if, I, if they match this heat pump, that's low. That's too low. Now, if I have an a old gas, or not old gas, if I do it with a pair, I could use a little gas, um, but this is a better match because what if I want to use all heat pump? What if gas goes up? So they're going to give you a good match. And notice this is basically down to your coldest temperature. There, I think it's like four hours a year below 10 on the average. So um, your climate's incredibly nice. I'm doing stuff for up in um, the high country of Colorado. It's a lot harder. This is a big slide. A lot of words, terrible, way too many words, but you'll get this slide. And all I, all I want to do is these are the questions you need to look at, think about when you're talking. Did they use manual J? Is it a nicely matched system? You know, it, this is important. Did you derate for altitude? So at a very high altitude, because the air is thinner, it doesn't hold as much heat per cubic feet, the capacity of the units is reduced. They can compensate to some extent. So that you'll, you'll end up putting in a bigger unit than that sea level. The, most, the good contractors who up should all know this. If they don't do that, then you need to go elsewhere. 
um, can it do it down to the coldest temperature? This is important right here. I'm going to just talk for a second about this. If you get a system, you say, I, you don't have gas right now, you have an electric furnace, or you don't want gas, or you don't want propane, whatever. You put a heat pump. Inside the heat pump, they have often a little electrical heat because maybe for those four hours below 10 needs a little extra. Well, in your climate, you can ask to the contract, are you, or is there going to be a little electrical heat in the unit? They might say, no, I'm not, I'm not having any. I don't need it. It's big enough. Or yeah, I have a little. Bit. Now, what might happen is you can ask, will this require me to upgrade my electrical paint? The heat pump uses about as much energy as an air conditioner. So typically for the heat pump itself, you've got enough capacity in the electrical panel. But if you have a heat pump and a big electric strip, you might have upgraded. And that's expensive, can be expensive. So if that's true, you could say, all right, well, can you upsize the heat pump a little bit? I don't want to pay for my panel upgrade. Or maybe I already got natural gas, already got propane. I'm just going to go with a hybrid system. So these are questions you can read through. Um, this is important. Spend a couple minutes on this slide. So you've got existing ducting. Now, heat pumps put out, the air temperature um, is 95 to 105, furnaces are warm. If you've put your hand next to a register of a heat pump, it's not gonna feel warm, warm like the furnace. It'll feel a little warm, maybe neutral. But it's important because basically with duct system, the new house, you would design a little bit bigger duct system. So they have to look at it and say, is the, the duct system good enough for the heat pump? system or proposing? Am I going to have good enough airflow? And typically, they will say, yeah, I measured it's going to be good. Or they might say, well, I need to add, this is very uh, unusual, a couple little returns, because in a lot of places, the returns aren't big enough, or maybe a little supply. So they might have to add a little. Important thing, sealing and insulation. If you have an old system, are they going to seal it? And you really want them to insulate it, especially if it goes in spaces like attics, which are unconditioned. Ask them, is this going to make, I have an uncomfortable part of my house. Is this going to make it comfortable? And I would really, if you don't have zoning, um, two zones in your house, top floor, bottom floor, or more south, east, west, I would consider that. It's the systems are inexpensive, easy to put in. Um, and you want them to have it, you know, sometimes a duct system might be, says, well, I can only put in this size. Well, as large as possible. And care about thermostats, um, where they are makes, makes a big difference. Um, are they, is it in your mass bedroom, or just in the hall? Um, and with heat pumps, they're a little different. <clears throat> We're so used to saving energy, cranking the thermostat back. And heat pumps, you can crank it back a little bit at night, but you don't wanna crank it way up in the morning. So you wanna have gradual little steps, two degree steps. So that's something most people, and actually some contractors don't know you just want to have little gradual adjustments. So my house, for example, I set it to 68 in the day, 64 at night, and then I have a thermostat that it comes on at like 5 a.m. 66, and then 7 a.m. 68. Um, mini splits, you basically they got to take care of the indoor and outdoor unit for elevation, and you want to have it kind of balanced. So. Um, Couple things about the outdoor units. Um, you know, it's an air conditioner. They're trying to make them super quiet. They're really getting improvement. They do make some noise. If they don't mount them right to the walls, they'll vibrate. So you want to be, you know, where am I mounting it? I don't want it under my bedroom window. And I also don't want it next to the patio that I use all summer. So think about that. Um, they can get a little wind chill effect. The sun helps with the defrost. So try to avoid the north. Southeast is good. You don't have near the snow in Colorado, but you do have it. Um, snow shelter is nice. You don't want to have to shovel out your heat pump. And you really want to mount the unit above the average snow depth or maximum month. I think 12 inches. I kind of looked at some stuff. You all would know better. 12 inches might be good. And they have to do stuff like, you know, line sets have to be good. Um, and these are some questions you can ask them. What's the warranty? And I think Ask them for pictures of installations and you'll see how nice a job they do. These are beautiful up here.
Um, finding contractors that do heat pumps, like I said, I think you probably have more down here than we do in Colorado. Um, friends who had heat pumps. Um, now it'll be interesting because if you have friends in Southern New Mexico that get a normal heat pump, uh, that's gonna be a little bit different than the cold climate ones because they gotta you know, take into account this stuff a little bit colder. <clears throat> manufacturers websites i think the main thing i do is look on the contractors websites if they talk about heat pumps they do heat pumps if they don't talk about heat pumps they probably don't a um, couple other things get a couple quotes to start um, i've been i was in this business a long time um, people really try to do a good job design and stuff you're asking them to do more if they're close then they're probably fair if they're way apart they're not um, cautious of low quotes you know they might end up, you might end up with this picture like that or something. Um, and then there's a lot of online stuff. Um, very cautious because I've, you know, I've researched a lot of these online and they're basically importers. They have a warehouse, they sell online. Um, you really don't have support tech. You know, this is 15 years. Um, you need to have good support, people to come back, service it, keep it, keep it good. That, contractors are you know not incentivized to do that whereas if you do a purchase you've got this whole support structure so um, <clears throat> you can look through this you know they work well in the climate zones um, they say this I guess that oh should be five um, they work well um, they save some money you got some mini splits um, consider your contractor teammate if you get a good contract they're really going to do a great job for you and um, and talk to local contracts. And basically this is uh, evolution of new technology. And here's a couple contacts. If your electricity is from Tri-State, uh, contact them about it. Here's some weatherization assistance. And this is my contact information if you, if you want to, um, you know, we're gonna do the uh, chat now, but if you have a specific project question, something, feel free to give me, give me an uh, email. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. So if anyone has any questions, uh, you can type them in the chat and we can go through some of those if you have any specific questions about anything. So I know for me, it was a lot of new information. So, um, so I, I have one question. Uh, possibly. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you mentioned Texas. Um, so what happens in like extreme weather events like Texas had to deal with this year? Um, well, yes, if if you, you know, if you have a power, if you're that's that's kind of one of the advantages of the hybrid system, because you've got, you know, kind of a backup. Now, if your electricity goes out and unless you have backup to run the fan of the furnace, which uses a lot less. Um, and you can, that's very reasonable to do. So you, you can have that strategy. So if you're, if you're really concerned about resiliency and you're in a region where the power does go out like that, then I would, then I would recommend a hybrid system. And what I would recommend looking online is um, they make wonderful sort of small batteries, this, um, that are all electric and you just have them plugged in and they're fully charged. And then uh, you you might want to look at how your furnace, you know, the electrical is, um, and, and be able to just plug the furnace fan, in, uh, which you'd have to do anyway, even if you didn't have it. You know, if you want to keep your house, you want to keep your house warm. Um, and the other thing was, um, let's see, thing. there's a couple other ones. So all this um, does apply to existing homes. So for example, someone asked about um, existing homes. So this would be the strategy. Uh, okay, so with an existing home, um, if you have this situation, so you have a furnace right now and, and or an air conditioner. Um, <clears throat> and let's say that your air, your furnace went let's say it's the same generation and your furnace went and 
the contractor came out and said, well, it's time to replace both. You would essentially put in a heat pump. It would be like the air conditioner, but it would be reversible inside. And you would put the furnace in. And then what you would do is talk to the contractor and say, uh, okay, I want to think about how I want to set up my, my system. Um, if I want to go for the absolute lowest cost, and gas is around here. I might just use, I use mostly gas heating. I might use the heat pump for a little bit. So the contractor shows you and it says at 45 degrees, go to the heat pump or at 50 degrees. Gas is a little bit more. You might say to the contractor, okay, uh, show me how to set it. So the heat pump does it down, the heat pump does it to 25 or 30 degrees, then I use a little gas. So. Um, and then the other scenario is, like I said, if you have um, baseboard heating, electric baseboard heating, and you don't want to pay so much, you can have someone come in and say, well, how can I do my whole home with a mini split system? I might have a couple of these units. How can I do the second floor with a mini split system? Or if you have an uncomfortable party, say the second floor is really hot. You've always wanting to cool it, but you don't want to build ducts and air conditioning, uh, ducts and everything. You could go with these mini splits. So, um, yes, these this works. This for new or existing home. The COP significant um, increases in COP in the coming years. Um, I guess. The trend has been HSPF. The trend has been, um, and this, you know, HSPF and CRP are basically tied together. Um, it's been about one to two of these every generation of heat pumps. So, uh, but I think it's going to, even though it's a jump, it seems to be they've squeezed a lot out of the technology. So I think it's going to start leveling off. So I'd say in, in maybe two years, um, this is really where most manufacturers are. This is like the absolute best here. There's only two units or series that are this good. So I'd say in two years, you might have 11 to 12. So, you know, you might have another jump of about 9% or so. So um, if your stuff's getting up there in age and or, and, or you want to um, improve your system or you want to, uh, you know, concerned about emissions, I wouldn't let this stop you. But if you got a couple, in a couple of years, you can expect probably, rather than most of them being 10 and a half, they'll be 11 and a half. Yeah. Um, let's see, I got some more. Why are ground loops so expensive? They seem to run about 20K extra. Um, it's, it's, it's just expensive to put them in, um, in, in Colorado and the high country, we it, often go with verticals. And the reason is in order for it to get a really efficient ground loop, you have to have moisture in the soil to get good thermal conductivity into the pipe. So if you're in Iowa or the Midwest, um, where you have decently damp soils and you've got a lot of land, you can get your tractor or backhoe out and just dig trenches and lay the pipes down. Um, and it's pretty cost effective, but out in, unfortunately in our area, um, it's pretty much drill holes. And um, it's just kind of expensive to drill. Part of it is it's hard as a business model because um, you don't necessarily have enough business in the winter. Um, they're getting a little better in the sense that now we're going to fewer deeper holes. Suggestion of getting quotes for heating with no cooling now versus heat pump heating and adding cooling. Um, well, the heat pump's going to give you heating and cooling no matter what. So uh, it depends on what your situation is. If you so you, you can, if you have propane or electric or you don't necessarily want to have gas anymore, you don't care about paying anymore, 
you can go out and get quotes for just a heat pump system to do the heating and they might have a little electrical backup. Um, so you're gonna automatically get the cooling um, out of the blocks. Um, and I'm not sure, um, the problem is if you wanna just get like a furnace quote and add the heat pump later, mm, that's a little tricky because the technology evolves. Um, you could do it probably within a year or two, but if it goes too long, you're going to ha uh, have mismatch of technologies. Given that uh, due to failed system, as hot, there's a high probability you simply put in what was there to meet the immediate needs. Please comment on how to best minimize this response. Um, actually, I think the probably the best way to minimize that response or to uh, do that would be to get quotes of a hybrid system right away. So if your if your furnace fails, and uh, so if you have a furnace and an air conditioner, let's say you have a furnace, your furnace fails, the the HVAC person should be able to give you a quote for a furnace and a heat pump. Now they can come out and put the furnace in and run the line sets. And if they don't have the heat pump, uh, you know, if it's still on order, it's gonna take a week or so, they can come and set that later. So that's that's not a problem. If the air conditioning fails and it's extremely hot and it's cooling time, um, basically you're gonna have the same issue with the air conditioner. They, most of these places now have not quite, but quite a few heat pumps in stock. So you should be able to get uh, a quote for the equivalent heat pump and an air conditioner about the same uh, about the same speed. So um, if your system's getting really old and you want to do this or you're inclined to do this, um, I would go out and you know talk to people and start get a couple quotes. Um, you know, maybe you get one quote, maybe you're not ready to pull the trigger, but you've got one, you've got some idea, you, you've talked to someone good, and now something happens, you know what to do. Uh, I've only gas heating now. If I can get heat pump heating and add cooling, it would make a difference versus just add. Um, yeah, so if you have gas heating now, so you got a couple of options. Um, if your furnace is not that old, um, I would call the contractor and say, um, and make sure it's the same brand. Um, call a couple contractors in and say, I want to add, I don't want to just add AC, I want to add a heat pump. Now, I will tell you, and, but first you should try to find contractors that like heat pump or do heat pumps more. Um, if you just pick up the phone book and call a couple contractors, there's still a lot that are like, oh, just put an air conditioner. They don't really, um, it's hard for them to change their business model, you know? Um, whereas I look around and call a couple of contractors and say, all right, I don't want to add just, I want to add a heat pump. And if they, they might say, well, put an AC, say, give me the equivalent quote for the equivalent heat pump series. Um, Manual J is is um, a gen manual J is a, a general method for calculating the heating loads of a house, um, and it is uh, ACCA and ASHRAE, American um, Society of uh, Heating and Cooling uh, Engineers, and the ACCA, which is the industry group. It the strategy gets updated periodically. Um, there's the most of the HVAC manufacturers have a software package that does that calc for you. And there's some generic ones, like I use ones called Write Suite. That's a big one. So if I show you like here, this output of um, right here. So for example, this is an output and it, it wouldn't matter. So it tells me this is the temperature this is how many hours it's gonna, uh, the climate's in that 
this is how much heating I, I need. So these three columns are the important things right here. You can see it on the left. This is actually defined by what kind of equipment I want to put in there. So this one, um, I had the heat pump. If I put a furnace in there, it would just be, you know, 70,000 BT furnace, it would be 70,000. So this then calculates the efficiency, the fan, it'll give you the fuel, it'll give you the fan energy, et cetera. So that's how, that's how manual J works. Um, and then I should, while we're here, um, the appendix just has a couple things. Um, if you're in, um, so the appendix, um, this talks about cold climate heat pump specifications. Now, and this then, there's some other stuff here. This is some of the, so these are the cold climate, oh, I should have changed, I had Colorado, that's obviously for your climate zone too, I'll switch that, but these are the cold climate series, like these are a lot of the, the higher end systems for the cold climates. These are mini splits that you can look at. This is the page on the air to water. And then if you're curious, uh, well, I don't know how much I spend on heating. I have electric heating. This is a formula that can help you do that. You can figure that out. Um, so I don't know, I think, I think that's about all that we have on the questions. Um, Thank you again, anyone who's still on for taking the time out. And like I said, um, here's my email put up again. Um, and uh, Elizabeth's going to send it out, but I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth. Great. Thank you, Dave, for sharing all of your um, expertise and knowledge about this. It was really informative. And um, again, you see his email there. We will be sending out some of the information um, to the email where you registered. So um, look for that as well as the survey that we will be sending to you. And um, we uh, thank you for spending your time with us here tonight. Um, if you're interested in any other programs, you can check them out at peaknature.org. Um, we have upcoming a look at the night sky. There's a program um, for the June night sky. It tells you what to look for. Uh, we also have an upcoming in-person geology tour this weekend. So Ooh. if you're interested in that, you can check that out. So thank you again for coming, everybody.